I totally agree with him. So here's what I would encourage you guys to do. Next week, those are going to be available while we have uh, supplies. But again, you could get them anywhere. And you might even know someone who owns one. So just, you know, borrow it from them, shoplift it somewhere. Just get it by the second week of September because that's when we're going to be actually getting into this all together. I'm super, super excited about that and, and seeing what God does as a result of it. So definitely buckle up for that. Two other pieces of uh, church business before we jump into the sermon today. And one is baptism. A lot of you have been baptized at this church. Many of you have not been baptized at all. If you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized yet, I want to encourage you to take that step. Um, in your program, there's information about how to sign up for that. And baptism is not something that saves you. Baptism is saying, I've already been saved. Jesus is one who saved me, and I want to proclaim this to my church family, and I want to proclaim what he's done and his good work and his good grace, and, uh, and that's something that is something every believer is called to do. So if you have yet to do that, step up, step into that, and you could uh, find out more information about that in your program. Also, in, uh, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but it's been really depressing watching the news. Have you? Yeah, it's kind of messed up. Um, and and it's, very, it's one of those times where we talk about this stuff, I think, in our own families or with friends or coworkers a lot. But sometimes it's very easy for churches just to kind of fly under the radar and hope that everyone's kind of dealing with stuff on their own, which is fine as long as you're not a family and a church is a family. And so as a family, what we're going to do in two weeks is we're going to be um, just recognizing that God has called us to be, and as one person put it, uh, the type of people that holds the Bible in one hand and, and has a copy of the newspaper in the other, able to exegete and navigate the times in a way that's biblical and, and godly. Not only for the way that we interact with those on the outside, but how we navigate our, our own internal um, perspectives on things. And so we're going to be talking about that in two weeks. Um, I'm working on a sermon for that right now. And so that's Labor Day weekend. So if you've got great Labor Day weekend plans, just cancel them and just come on over here. And uh, we're going to be actually talking through that to, to really position ourselves to be people who are real in the world. And you can't be real in the world if we don't really understand God's perspective when we're going through this stuff. Okay? Okay, all right, so May 20th, 2000, um, it was a uh, kind of this uh, rainy, foggy, windy day, um, and there's this conference on that date, May 20th, 2000, called the Passion One Day, and uh, there's this guy uh, named John Piper, a lot of you guys have heard of him, but before most people had heard of John Piper, um, John Piper was this, just this old guy who gets up in front of thousands and thousands of college-age students, and the title of his sermon to them in the midst of all the music that was at this festival was this, Don't Waste Your Life. And actually, seven and a half minutes of that, that sermon were um, said to be seven and a half minutes that changed a generation. Um, pretty phenomenal stuff if you ever get a chance to look it up or Google it later on today. Um, but in essence, he was talking to a group of people at the beginning of their vocational life and their career life and even their new family life. He was challenging them with a, with a different way of thinking and the reality that many of us end up wasting our life rather than investing it wisely. And so today, I, um, we, we just finished with Leviticus, and, and this was something that um, I've been wanting to preach on and talk through, and also it was specifically what it means for us as a church family. And so if you've got your Bibles, if you could turn to Romans chapter 12, um, we're just going to be looking at Romans chapter 12, and then we're going to be pivoting on over to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, Romans is, as you know, um, written by a guy named Paul, um, someone who made one of the greatest impacts on world history, let alone Christian history, um, in, in his writings and the spread of Christianity. This skeptic turned uh, follower of Jesus um, just radically changed everything. And, and if you want to see one of the most beautiful theological, just like consolidations of what it means to be a Christian, the book of Romans is amazing. People who don't believe in God love the book of Romans just uh, as a piece of, of, of just an intelligent thought. So beautiful. But as a Christian, I mean, the hi it highlights even more. And so he gets through the end of chapter 11, where he finishes with this song, this doxology about how awesome God is. And this is all the things that God has done for us. And look what God has done. And then he gets into chapter 12 and he starts off with this. This is chapter 12 beginning in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, and he's saying therefore because of all the amazing stuff I just talked to you about in that doxology song. Therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, 
then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we take a look at that, we just like break it down into chunks, and we look and we see um, that the, if we start at the end, this is what every single human being is after. I mean, I don't care if you're an atheist or a Christian. You want to know, if, am I making wise choices? Am I, am I going the right way? Is this the right job? Is this the right spouse? Is, I mean, is it, am, I, am I investing my life good or am, am I just blowing my world up? What am I, how am I supposed to know if I'm going the right way? As a Christian, you tack on to that the fact that we believe that God is sovereign and that he has a calling on our life. And so we say, not only do I want to know if I'm doing a, a, a wise thing, but I want to know if I'm doing something that God has called me to do. And so what Paul says is everything that you are after, right there. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will. Not only will you have God's will, but you're going to be able to test it. You're going to be able to see, is this accurate? So how do you get there? Start up at the beginning. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So again, in view of everything God has done, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Why a living sacrifice? I mean, everyone in the pagan and Hebrew world knew sacrifice to be something as, if I want something from the gods, whether it's atonement or direction or whatever, I have to, I'm going to bring something that will be, something alive is going to be sacrificed and then I'm going to receive. Paul is making this preposterous to many proposition that we don't need to do that, that we don't need to make a sacrifice. Something doesn't have to die because Jesus already did. Jesus already was the sacrifice. And because Jesus was already the sacrifice that gets us to God, we then can turn, not sacrifice our life like I'm going to die, but I could basically take everything that's, that's subpar in my life, everything that's away from God in my life, and I could sacrifice that and say, this is not me. I'm going to sacrifice that. I'm going to let my life be a living sacrifice to him. My whole life, Jesus has already accomplished everything. The rest of my life is a victory lap. And so my life is this constant sacrifice to him, which sounds great. So all we got to do is just surrender our life to Jesus, and then we're going to know what God's will is, right? What's the problem? The problem is the middle section. The problem is the middle section because what gets in the way of that is the pattern of this world. And that's, that's a tough concept to chew on. Um, what, what did that mean in the first century? What does that mean in the 21st century? What, what is the pattern of this world? But I think that we can, we can really assess that by just looking at the pattern of life. What's the first chapter of life? This is not a trick question. What is the first chapter of life? Birth. Okay, birth and childhood, okay? It's in this period when all of a sudden you are born and you're uh, growing up as a, as a child. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? This is crazy town, right? Because you're growing up and all of a sudden you have all of these needs. You need to know if you're going to be fed. You need to know if you're, if you're loved by your family. You need to know if you're good at anything. That's all taking place in this, this period of time. And as a baby or a child, when you don't get your needs met, when you are not serviced with all these needs, what do you do? Cry. And what do people tell you? Stop acting like a child. This makes no sense, but this is right here. I've got needs, I've got needs, I've got needs. I know I've got needs, and you are supposed to meet my needs. That's this zone. What's the next chapter? Okay, adolescence. And we're just going to go ahead and put these four numbers up because they're the pivotal milestone. <laughs> I didn't know that was funny. <laughs> it's hilarious. At each one of these points, we have something unique happen where a new reality about me is there. I'm either, either I can do something or I become something. What, what is it at 13? You're a teenager. Do you remember this? Because like last year you were 12. You were a child. But now you're 13. Like I remember, I remember, do you remember being ecstatic about being a teenager? Because I remember at 13, I'm like, adults hate us. I love that. I'm 13. I'm a teenager. When, when you're 16, what can you do? You can drive. Freedom. And back then, there was no cell phone, so parents couldn't track us. It was awesome. And it's like, I could go anywhere I want. And, the, and my, I'm still telling my mom and dad things I did that they didn't know about. 16. What about 18? You can vote. You can go to college. Okay, so that's right there. What about 21? Drink. Okay, so 13, 16, 18, 21. These are all milestone, like, freedoms. Like, yes. One problem. We're 13, 16, 18, and 21. We have a bunch of new freedom. We do not have the wisdom to go with it. And this is not a dig against anyone who's in this spectrum, in this range, because I don't care what you've done, I was dumber than you, okay? 
I'm just saying that this was newfound freedom without wisdom. And the impulse, just the the nature of being more impulsive produced something in people. And it's not, uh, there's actually a phrase for it. It's not a phrase that people would, in this spectrum, would say now. But it's because it's dumb. It's a very dorky phrase. But it's something that describes it well. And it's this. What does this mean? What does it mean? You only live once. You only live once. Expressing the view that one should make the most of the present moment without worrying about the future. And often as a rationale for impulsive or reckless behavior. I just ordered $40 worth of Chinese food, but YOLO, right? Okay, I hate YOLO. Like whenever I would see someone hashtag YOLO, I'm just like, ooh, unfriend. Because it just, it drives me bonkers. But listen, that is something that like, there's like, I can do this. I mean, the consequences there, but who cares? YOLO! And you just go and do it, right? What's the next chapter? Yeah, yeah, young adulthood. Let's just go ahead and like clump it into the 20-somethings and 30-somethings. This is like a a period of life where all of a sudden, all of the freedom that you are starting to taste, you now have, and but now you've got the responsibility on top of it. So it's weird. Life is different than you thought it was going to be. It's a little bit more complicated. You're, maybe you're finishing college or you're starting a job and all of a sudden you're like, man, like life is hard and it's work. And then you got like, oh, I'm gonna, but I'm going to get married. If I fall in love, it's going to be so good. And then you got married and you're like, it's hard. And then like, oh, but, we, but kids are going to fix it. No. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're going through and you're realizing, oh, don't know what I'm doing. And all of a sudden you feel radically insecure because your life is out of control. You don't know what you're doing and you're seeking solace. You're seeking some type of, someone help me understand that I'm not the only one who's freaking out because I'm burning myself out. I'm trying to do things and I'm not satisfied like I thought I was going to be back here. So you seek solace and some type of like, like community on social network. And then all of a sudden you realize how awesome everyone else's life is or looks like it is. And their marriage, and their, and their like vacations, and junk like that. And you're like, I hate my life, and I hate them. And all of a sudden, you have this thing that was developed, a phrase um, a couple years back, called FOMO. What's FOMO mean? Fear of missing out. Anxiety that an exciting or interesting event may currently be happening elsewhere, often aroused by posts seen on social media websites. Now, here's the thing. You've heard of a ha- uh, midlife crisis, right? There is now a thing called a quarter-life crisis. <laughs> oh, you think I'm joking. <laughs> Huffington Post talked about it. While the term may have only been coined in recent years, it's become increasingly clear that the quarter-life crisis is a very real thing. The phenomenon, which can occur any time between one's early 20s and early 30s, is characterized by disappointments, insecurities, loneliness, and depression. And a study published in the International Journal of Behavioral Development found that 39% of men and 49% of women reported feeling such a crisis in their 20s. Furthermore, according to a survey conducted by Gumtree.com, 86% of young people admitted to feeling under pressure to succeed in their relationships, finances, and jobs before hitting 30. 32% felt under pressure to marry and have children by the age of 30, and 21% wanted a complete career change. The promise I had here didn't pan out here. I just, I just tell you, man, I just want, to, I want a little bit of satisfaction. I just want, I'm not asking for a lot. I just want a little. And it's so frustrating because I, I, I can't afford the things that I think I need and my, my life is not going anywhere and it's absolutely frustrating. But that's okay because there's the next chapter. What's the next chapter? Midlife, 40s to 50s. Let's put it that, in 40s to 50s, okay? And if you're here, you... You made it. You made it. You got here. Like you can buy the stuff now. Like you got the toys, right? And you got enough money for them or you got enough debt for them, right? It's awesome. The house, the truck, the stuff that you want, the 40s and 50s, you now are at a place where it's there and you're now at a place in your work where you feel like you're decently there and you're not as disrespected as you were back here and now you're sending your kids off to college and but you're starting to realize I have poured my life out I have poured my life out for my work and I'm actually at a point where I'm ask, asking the question was any of that worth it I'm at, I poured my life out for my family and whether it's my spouse or my kids I don't feel like I'm getting the respect or the gratitude 
required for everything I poured into them. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a business person, I've poured and I've poured and I've poured and I'm done. I'm empty. Is any of my life, does any of it have any reason or rationale or purpose? I don't know anymore. Like all of these idealistic aspirations I had here have died by here. But it's okay. I've given and given and given. There's coming a day when I no longer have to give anymore and I could just receive a little bit, finally. And what is that final chapter? <laughs> Florida. I have to be honest, I have um, a bias against Florida. I hate Florida. I hate it. But I tell you this much, um, this, is, this is honestly what a lot of people, they look at this as the dream. At least I get the final couple decades of my life just to relax and not have to serve the man and not have to serve my family. My family can go and do whatever they want. I'm just going to relax because I deserve it. I've poured my life out. And John Piper on May 20th, 2000 said, hundreds of you here don't give a rip about the eternal difference your life makes. You don't care. All you want is to graduate from college, find a life partner, get married, maybe have a couple of kids, maybe have a nice house, maybe have a good job with good benefits and sweet vacations that you could post about. Retire early, die a quick death and have no hell. That's all you want. This is the American dream. And he says, don't buy that dream. He talked about how three weeks prior, he did a funeral service for two missionaries that their church supported in Cameroon. Uh, two ladies that were in their 80s, um, they were single their whole life. One gave her whole life to Cameroon. One was in the medical profession up until retirement. And then when she retired, she moved to Cameroon to support this person in her ministry. She was working with the poor and the sick and proclaiming Christ's glory to them. And this person in the medical profession was able to come alongside. And in their 80s, they're driving on a road and the brakes go out and they go right over a cliff and instantly die. And he asks his church, is this a tragedy? And he said, no. Two people who gave their entire life to Jesus, used their giftings and their time and their availability for Jesus and died an instantaneous death going out in a blaze of glory. That is not a tragedy. And then he said, this is a tragedy. And he takes a article that he pulled out of Reader's Digest from 1998, and he read it, and it talked about um, Bob and Penny, and the, the article in Reader's Digest was just ecstatic about the fact that Bob and Penny were able to retire early, Bob at 59 and Penny at 51, and they were able to leave their home and their community and go down to, uh, to, to Florida. Florida. Punta Gorda, Florida. And buy a 30-foot yacht and spend every day playing softball and collecting seashells. Piper said that, that is a tragedy. As a Christian, that is a tragedy, to spend the final two decades of your life living for yourself, so that when you feed, as soon as your death comes and you meet your Savior face to face, you can lift up to him your collection of seashells and say, see, see what I did? You wanna, you wanna see my swing? Can I show you my boat? He says, that's a tragedy. That is a way one wastes their life. The truth is, is that when it comes to the concept of the pattern of this world, the whole thing is a really, really desperate and sad reality that my whole life, no matter what it looked like on the outside, from the beginning to the end, has been around and focused on the pleasures and the comforts and the service of one person. That if you want to look at every chapter of my life from the beginning to end, the defining person, in spite of what it looks like on the outside, was me. This is the way we waste our life. Because there's not a single person that's a Christian that's going to get to the end of their life. And if this is the defining person, person that their life is in service to, will they be satisfied? No. 
In fact, if, if we want to know the opposite of that, the, the way that we counteract the pattern of this world starts right up there at the top again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. The truth is that if we want to be a people that are not wasting our life, we lose it. We lose our life in service to others. It, it, Piper wrote a book off of that sermon that, that I encourage you to, to read, but if you want to sum it up, it basically is this. You're going to either lose your life or waste it. It's better to lose your life serving Jesus than to waste it on yourself. You're either going to lose your life or waste it. What is it going to be for you? If we pivot from Romans and we jump over to Hebrews chapter 6, we see the specificity of, of what service looks like. Why we serve who we serve, how we're supposed to serve, and what, what the ultimate outcome of that service is. And the reason why we serve is because we are blessed. This is an awesomely like, popular hashtag, but it's more than that. The truth is, is that we are, if you're a Christian, you are blessed. Because again, remember what, what Paul said. Paul said, therefore, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that he has done for us, that is why we lay down our bodies as living sacrifices. The author of Hebrews in chapter 6 like tags that by saying this, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. If you serve here at this church, I might forget your work. I might not appreciate or applaud you the way you deserve. But you know who's not? God. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him. As Christians, we have this, bl- this amazing reality that we have this, that as people who are blessed, we're blessed first off because God made us. No matter what anyone has told you in your life, no matter how people have told you you're intelligent or dumb, beautiful or ugly, valuable or worthless, God looks at you as someone who's created in his image and says, you are mine and I have created you. Your life, your life is owed me because I am your creator. That's first off. But second off, not only that, but we are actually bought back by God. We're not only his creation, but we've broken and rebelled against him. And we deserve death and hell. And what did he do? He bought us back. And so we owe him our life two times over. And God could have left it at that. You owe me your life, so serve me with all that you've got. But he doesn't. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. God chooses not only to bless you with life and salvation, but blesses you by rewarding you. That blows me away that he would do that, but he does. That is the type of God we serve. It's amazing. And if you're looking for a picture of of someone who's serving out of the vantage point of being blessed, here's the picture right here. This is Jerry and Alan Laux. And if you've spent five seconds at Manuka Bible Church, you've seen them because they're serving everywhere. They probably served you your coffee today or, or they were, they're out there. You know, I go through the week and I, I forget that Jerry on the left there is not on staff because she's here so much. She's at the food pantry. She's doing everything. And she, I remember these two guys being baptized. I remember Jerry and Alan being baptized. And from that point, several years ago, now to this point, them pouring their life over and over and over again. Jerry was just on the left, was just um, honored in, uh, in the newspaper, they, once a year they do the, the Hero magazine where they honor volunteers in this area, just a select few. And for the work that she's done in this community through this church, she's been honored for that as one of the recipients, which is awesome. So if you see her out there, give her a hug. And, and I asked Allie Selk, who wrote the article, to give me a quote. This is what Jerry said. I am blessed and feel like I can give it back to the, to the church and to the Lord for blessing me so much. The response of being blessed is not simply just to hoard it, not just to, to, just to enjoy it and bench sit, but actually say, I've been blessed. I'm, that calls me into a different calling. And, and, and if you go to, like, if you ch- search Jerry Laux on Facebook, you're going to find her, but you're not going to see, like, a profile picture because she doesn't have one. She doesn't even have a cover photo on her Facebook, but she's got tons of pictures that she didn't take. Other people have taken and tagged her in it, her serving around this church over and over and over and over again. Why? Because she's blessed. She's not special. She's not, she's not someone who's, who's greater or better than you. She simply recognizes, maybe different than you, that she's blessed. And out of that blessing comes service. You have one life. Don't waste it living entitled or expecting that happiness stems from your pleasures. It doesn't. But joy does come from serving God through serving others. That's the why. So who? Who are we called to serve? As Christians, we're called to serve everyone, but specifically, we see a unique calling to serve God's family. And we we see this in that book, in the book of Hebrews. The next verse says this, 
Uh, this is part of what we already read. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. This concept of family is the reality that when you're a Christian, you're not simply called into a faith that's awesome. I got me and God. This is great. I'm going to see him one day in heaven. But that you're actually brought into a group of people that is a family. And if Manuka Bible Church is your family, then you have a role here. You have a part here. A valuable part. If you're a Christian, you have something you bring to the table here that is unique to you. I want, okay, now, last night, they, they really had a hard time with what I told them to do with this. But I'm, I'm going to ha- ask anyone who has served in the past year in some capacity to stand in just a second. And I'm going to list off the different ministries and just stand when that ministry comes up. And so I want to encourage you to, as opposed to Saturday service, that we're, we're just sitting there going, does he mean to, when he says stand, does he mean stand? Yes, I mean stand. And so like when I, if you've served in the past year in one of these capacities, I want to encourage you to stand. If you've served as an usher, please stand. Greeter, a teacher in a Bible study, a real life group leader, a women's conference volunteer, a master's men cook, a library cafe coffee server, a worship band member, a tech or vo- audio or video volunteer, an adventure outpost nursery worker, a deacon board member, a program folder, an echo weekend or echo midweek volunteer, building maintenance and repair, divorce care, CR, spy kids volunteer, parking lot direction, food pantry, mercy team, or any other ministry that I've forgotten, um, program folder, program folder, okay, or any other ministry I've forgotten to name this past year, if you could please stand. Yes, yeah. yes, thank you. <laughs> all right, let's give it up for these folks, all right? All right. Awesome. All right, now let's have a seat. Now, if you're not standing up right now, this is the coolest thing because this is the perfect week for you. We're actually like giving you an opportunity to say, I'm going to get off the bench. I'm going to actually step in. And we, we, want you to, we want you to know that you are so, and if you're not standing, it's on us. And so we want to, this weekend, give you the opportunity to step up and step in. And we, that's something that we're super excited about. Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, said that if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit has been given to you with special giftings that were intended to be used for the common good. That's your church family. That means that if you are a Christian and you're at this church and this is your church home and you're not serving or bringing those giftings to the plate in some way, shape, or form, we're bankrupt without you. Even if your gifting is just time. Even if your gifting is just availability. Even if you're like, I've got no skills. Sweet, we can use you that we have a place for you because this is the kingdom and we're calling you to step in. And when you do that, you see the lifestyle. This is not just a, like a good deed. It's a lifestyle that you're stepping into. The author of Hebrews in the next verse says that. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. It's not like a flash in the pan. It's not just like a one, one and done. It's the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. The Greek in the, in the beginning right here, when it says we want, it's, it's stronger than that. It's like, I desperately want you. The author of Hebrews is talking to his friends. And he's saying, listen, I care about you. And I, because I care about you, I don't want your Christian walk simply to be a belief that flatlines all of your actions. I want your belief to actually spur and animate you into a life that is full. I desperately want you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. And that too is way too soft. Because it literally says, to the fullest hope. The biggest hope you could possibly have as a human being, you will realize by getting everything that you want, no. By having the job that's, that's just perfect fit for you, no. By getting married, uh-uh. Having kids, no. The fullest hope, according to the author of Hebrews, is this reality of bringing yourself into God's work alongside God's people. You know, every movement, especially the early church, every movement needs hope. Movements die without hope. And the early church needed that. And the author of Hebrews says, you want to know what that looks like? When you are partnering alongside one another, serving God, you see it. You want your life to be full of hope? I'll tell you where it's found. It's not found in just having a great life. It's a disappointing life. It's in this. We step into that in significant ways. Once you live that lifestyle out, you start seeing a legacy. A legacy is, is what happens in someone's life when they don't simply do something for a season, but they make it life. They don't do it for the applause because as soon as people stop applauding and thanking them, 
They're not gonna jump ship and just forget about it, but they continue and they, all of a sudden they start seeing this legacy. Every single person here, whether you're a Christian or not, you're here because of the legacy of someone else. Someone tipped you off. The fact that Jesus is true. Someone showed you the picture of what it looked like to follow his lead. Someone taught you. Might have been a parent. Might have been a Sunday school teacher. Might have been someone at this church. I don't know. But someone left a legacy for you. And you are a people that can actually walk and t- say, I'm picking up the baton and going. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And so church, if you're here this morning and you're in this category, you're a little kid or you're a child and you're in this room right now, I just want to let you know that we love you and we desperately want to sacrifice time and scheduling to actually pour into you. We want you to have a a clear picture of the gospel and who Jesus is and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that that happens. If you're in this demographic, I want you to not believe a lie that I believed when I was growing up, which was you're only really useful in church when you get into like your old adult, like 31. I thought that. (laughs) This church does not believe that. This church believes that if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is working inside of you and you are so useful, a so useful minister at this age as any other minister in this church, including the staff. God has got a calling on your life and we want to position you to actually step up and step in. That's why in Echo, we want to see adult teachers right alongside people who are in their high school years. That's why we do spy kids. That's why we do these things so that we can see the next generation recognizing, I'm not the next generation of the church. I'm not the future church. I'm the church right now. So I want to challenge you today when you're walking out there to find areas that you can step into and not just think it's for the old fogies. This is for you. If you're in your 20s and 30s, I know, this is crazy town, and life is crazy busy. But honestly, as I was going through my 20s and 30s, a majority of the craziness of my life was the craziness I put on it myself. We set up our life to be way too busy. We say yes to way too much because we think it's right, it's wrong. We need to simplify our life and we need to prioritize the things of God. And I want to challenge you, if you're in your 20s and 30s, whether you're single, you're starting a family, or you've got a ton of kids, I want to challenge you to prioritize serving God and his people and say, but I feel like that's going to be a loss. We're going to miss out on this. You will. You absolutely will. But it's better that you lose your life than than, than to waste it. I'm telling you that as your pastor because I love you. But this is a critical point where you need to step in. If you're in your 40s and 50s and you're like, like really wrestling with your midlife crisis and you're like, do I buy the truck? I don't know. Do I? I don't know. I just want to challenge you to, to, to not let this period of time to be one that where, you know, you're like, your instantaneous trigger is going to be out of the, the depth of the, of the uh, last lack of satisfaction in my life. I'm going to satisfy that with things for me. I want to challenge you and push you into recognizing that God has called you into the mission. And that means to sign up for mission trips for sure, but to sign up for the weekly mission of what God's doing here. We need you. Your work may be looking at you in your 40s and 50s as someone who's coming to the end of their career. We don't. We need you right now. And if you are in the Florida department, I've got nothing against retiring, but I do have something against retiring from the kingdom. The last decades of your life should not be spent as if you were obsolete. And the only thing you're good for is sipping back a martini and relaxing in the sand. God has a greater calling on your life than that. He has called you into mission. And if you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, we not only value you here, but you are valued in the work you do here. Church, we are a people that need to be living under the reality of what these passages say. The reality that we serve as people who have been blessed by God and make serving our spiritual family as well as the world part of the lifestyle we live and the legacy that we leave. One of the greatest lines from the movie Braveheart was everyone dies, not everyone truly lives. And I'll say this, the people who die and not truly live in America are those who've lived by the American dream with the hope that it's their savior and it is not. We need to be a people who are reminded by the fact that we're going to either lose our life or waste it. It's better to lose our life serving Jesus than to waste it on ourselves. 
every single person here that is a Christian, every single person here, you have something that God is calling you into. What if you made your life valuable on an eternal scale, not simply on a 401k scale? What if your life was lived with the end game in mind rather than simply what is gonna bring you enough pleasure right now? I believe that not only will your life be more satisfied, but you're gonna see yourself glorifying God and you're gonna see him blessing you for that. And that is remarkable. I'm gonna pray for you for that because some of you are probably still like, Dude, I got people to see and things to do. My life is awesome. I'm gonna keep running the rat race of the American dream. So I'm gonna pray for you because that's, that's sin. <laughs> but I'm also gonna pray for our offering right after that. We're gonna get in the habit of praying for our offering for specific things that that, that goes into. One, this week, we're gonna pray for the food pantry. Um, that a portion of our, our offering every week goes into the food pantry. I want to pray for that. And then when I finish praying, I'm going to finish taking the offering, I'm going to have the benediction, and then I want you to go out and go shopping, okay? I want you to go over to the Library Cafe. I want you to go to First Impressions or one of the other ministries. I want you to step into it in a real way and actually step in and say, I'm going to actually do this. You know what? Give it three weeks. Sign up for a ministry for three weeks. If it's bogus, jump to another one, but give it three weeks and see what would happen. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, I pray over this group right here, God, a prayer of um, challenge and conviction. God, whenever you spoke, Jesus, you challenged our presuppositions about life. You convicted people of things that they didn't want to be convicted of. You wrecked people's lives. And everyone who followed your lead in the midst of that praised you for the life that they saw on the flip side of that decision. Lord, I pray that you challenge and push each one of us, no matter what decade we are living in, to surrender all of us to you for your glory, for your name, for your fame. God, I pray that today people will find ways that they will find not only the significance of of their skill set, but maybe even just their availability, God. Lord, people who um, don't feel connected in community will find community as they work alongside other brothers and sisters. And God, when we see this, we'll give you the thanks and the glory. We also, Lord, lift up um, our food pantry. God, I thank you so much for the fact that there's people in this church that serve um, the other people in our community who just need food. I pray, God, that that meets a physical need, but I pray that you stir inside of them a hunger to know how their spiritual life, God, can be reconnected with you. Lord, that that, that, that small action will just be a small picture of your generosity. Lord, they'll come to you. Lord, I pray that that they will find their ultimate need met in you, and we'll give you the thanks for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.